guys, you know what to do. Dear Tender Love. We've been waiting for this moment from the very beginning of our community, four years ago. Aaron Patterson, Tender Love, here in Lviv. I get, I get really, really nervous when I give talks, <laughs> and this isn't helping. <laughs> Actually, before we start, I want to take a selfie with everyone. I heard that it's that we're supposed to hug each other here, yeah. so I want to take a photo of everybody giving a hug. So can can we do that? Yeah. Is that okay? Okay. God, I'm so nervous now. <laughs> All right. So first, I want to say I want to say thank you so much for having me here. It really, it really, really means a lot to me. And I, I was I was actually really um, moved by the Pivrac rules. Uh oh, it's my thing. Ah, there we go. Uh, I I think that the the Pivrac rules are the best. I think that they are amazing. So. And, and I, want to, I want to encourage all of you to become a speaker. Uh, I think like it's really hard for new people to give talks or to get into speaking. And I think it's because a lot of people think, oh, well, I don't have anything, I don't have anything to teach anybody or I don't know what to say on stage. But the thing is, every single one of you knows something that somebody else doesn't. And you might not know what that thing is, but it doesn't really matter. Just get up on stage and talk about some idea or something that you're working on, anything that you do, uh, because somebody out there won't know about it and someone will learn something. There is somebody out there who is not as experienced as you and you can teach them something. So please become a speaker. The other thing I really liked about the rules are hugs. <laughs> this is good because I love hugs <laughs> and I want you to give me a hug. <laughs> So, so well, not now. We'll wait until after the. We'll wait. We'll wait until the after party to do that. Um, but yes, please, please come give me a hug. Say hello. Say hello to me. Um, so, I guess you know this. I don't need to say, but my name is Aaron Patterson. Um, my name on the internet is Tender Love, and if you don't recognize me in person, this is what I look like on the internet. Uh, <laughs> This is my real face here, uh, and I have I have a couple cats. Uh, this one, his name is Gorbachev Puff Puff Thunderhorse the uh, Third. <laughs> we call him Gorby. Uh, I'll tell you why. You can ask about his name later if you want. Uh, this is the, her name is uh, SeaTac Airport Facebook YouTube Instagram Snapchat. Uh, I think that's it. <laughs> we call it, we call her uh, just SeaTac for short. Actually, I I, <laughs> I felt so bad. I I like I introduced my cat to my presentations, and at one 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 conference, there was um, somebody uh, translating me into sign language, <laughs> and I thought, oh man, why did I say this name? This is so terrible for the sign language people. <laughs> Anyway, I I have I have stickers of my cats, so uh, if you'd like a sticker of my cat, come just come ask me. Like if you don't know what to say, like, if you want to come say something to me and you don't know what to say, ask me for a sticker. I'll give you I'll give you a sticker of my cat. So if you want one, just come say hi. I'll give you one. Uh, I work for a company called it's a tiny startup called GitHub. <laughs> We were recently acquired by a late stage, a late stage lifestyle business. <laughs> anyway, you could say you could say that uh, this is my active job. 
<laughs> All right, uh, so, so I, I'm on the Ruby core team and we're responsible for doing development on the Ruby language itself. I, I started looking through my commit history this year and I found out that this year is actually my 10th year. In October, it'll be 10 years since I've been on the Ruby core team. Uh, oh, thank you. Uh, I, I'm also on the Rails core team, responsible for developing Rails, and I decided to look through my history there as well, and I found I, I've been on the core team since 2011, but my first commit was in 2009. So almost, I guess it's 10 years committing as a committer and uh, eight years as a core team member, and Jeremy is the first one that merged my, my commit, so uh, I, I wanna talk, now I'm telling you about my history a little bit, and. I'm not doing this to just say like, oh, I'm, I'm great or anything, but I, I really wanna talk to you about why I've been in, or how I got involved in the community and why I've been involved for so long and why I've stayed for so long. And the first reason is that I, I just really love Ruby. I love the Ruby programming language. Uh, I've actually been doing development work since 1999. That's when I got my first programming job. Uh, I got a job, so I got into Ruby in around 2005 because some of my coworkers went to a conference called No Fluff, Just Stuff, where uh, Dave Thomas gave a presentation about Ruby and my coworkers brought it back and showed it to me. So at that time, around 2005, I was a reluctant Java programmer. Uh, and programming in Ruby felt like a, a breath of fresh air to me. Actually, before I was a Ruby programmer, I was a, I was a Perl programmer. So Ruby felt really, really nice to me. The, the language was just so easy. Everything, everything just worked the way that I thought it would work. When I made a mistake, it was easy to tell why. And I really liked the language because the basic patterns of the language were so easy to pick up. So you, you don't have to learn many rules in order to program in the Ruby programming language. And it meant that my mental overhead was a lot lower, and I'll show you exactly why later. Uh, I also didn't have to write a lot of boilerplate code. I really did not, as a Java developer, I did not like writing all those getters and setters. So I'm gonna show you an example of what I, like, I, I Googled Java 1.3 because that's what I had to program in at the time. So I'm gonna show you an example of programming in Java at that time. So this is, here's two examples here. They're doing the same thing. One is Java, one is Ruby. They're essentially taking two lists of strings and then just calling like two int on them basically, converting them to integers. So in Java 1.3 we didn't have uh, generics, so you had to pull everything out of a list, cast it, and then push it back, on, do whatever and push it back onto the list. Now the funny thing is that this Java example, I don't think it actually even works because when you do a parse int, it returns an int value, and that integer isn't actually an object, which means you can't push it onto an array list, which only supports objects. So this is what I'm talking about when I say mental overhead, where in Ruby, everything is an object, and you don't need to think about these particular differences, you just learn that one rule, everything is an object, so I can treat everything that way. So here I wanna talk a little bit about my first uh, serious Ruby program that I wrote. Uh, in, <laughs> in 2005, I wanted to see the Lord of the Rings movie. Uh, the third Lord of the Rings movie was coming out and it came, uh, it was being released and they were gonna show all three Lord of the Rings movies in one day. And that day was on my birthday. And I was, it, it was also a day early, so it was a day early release for the third movie. And I was really excited about this, I wanted to do it, uh, or I wanted to go see these movies for my birthday. So uh, I went to work, and they, they, were selling, they were selling movie tickets online. I went to work and I tried to buy the tickets, but of course the website was crashing. Uh, and also at the time I was working on a Java app, and this Java app took, no kidding, about 10 minutes to compile. So every time I had to make a change, or every time I made a change, I had to wait 10 minutes to test it. Um, so what I decided to do was, during this 10 minute break, I would write a Ruby program that would try to buy those movie tickets for me. And I wrote this program and I even put my actual credit card number into, <laughs> into the Ruby program, written to disk in a, in a plain text file. Uh, and so, so I wrote the program and what it did was it would, it would make a request and I knew what a failure case was. So I knew like, okay, uh, when I get an error, the page looks like this. 
And I knew if it failed, I'll just retry and keep retrying. I'll retry. And if I get a response that's different, uh, I'll just log a message, but I'll retry anyway. Uh, because my thought was that it's probably going to keep failing, but maybe with a different page or something. And if I see the log message, I can just kind of go take a look and fix it. Uh, so I ran the program, and I was doing my normal job, and I forgot that it was running. And then I looked in the terminal, and I saw, like, oh, man, there's a whole bunch of log messages. Oh, no, something changed. So I went to the website, and I tried going through the process, and it turns out that it had been succeeding over and over and over again. So I called the credit card company and I asked my credit card company and I asked them like a really awkward question. I said, "Hi, uh, <laughs> wasn't sure how to ask this. How how many times have I charged my credit card today?" <laughs> and they said, "Oh, well, you you charged it once." And I'm like, "Oh, wow, that's great." Uh, so then I called the ticketing company because I didn't think maybe like maybe they didn't actually get the tickets. Maybe I didn't you know it didn't actually work. So I called them and I said hi. You know I, I've been trying to buy tickets online and credit card company says I got charged, but I want to make sure that I got I actually got the tickets. And the, I gave the person my information and the guy the guy on the phone says oh yeah yeah we, I, it's right here you you bought two tickets. Uh, but it looks like we've actually tried to charge your credit card hundreds of times. <laughs> and I was like, oh, yeah, the, the website wasn't working, so I was just hitting refresh. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> so the moral of the story is uh, never write infinite loops. <laughs> Always have some sort of exit, exit strategy there. Anyway, so around that, like, I, I, also love, I also love Rails, and around that time was the same time when DHH made his, whoops, here's a blog video, and I, I decided to try it out, and I fell in love with Rails. To me, it had exactly the same features as Ruby. It was easy. It just worked. Everything worked the way I thought it was. It would work, and there was no boilerplate code. I really loved that about the framework and the language. But uh, there was something more to it than just these specific traits uh, not, not just these specific traits about Ruby the language and Rails the framework that drew me to the community, but actually the community values. It was the values of the language and the framework that really resonated me. They were my values. These values were Ruby and Rails were trying to shift all of the burden from the programmer onto the computer. Like, I don't want to do that work. I don't want to have to know about whether it's an int or an object. The computer should figure that stuff out for me. And this is the type of mentality that I wanted to work with. I wanted the computers to do, like, I'm lazy. I want the computer to do my job. Come on. <laughs> anyway, so this is what, I, what was important to me, was shifting the burden from the developer to the, to the computer. And this is what I wanted to do every day, but unfortunately, I was a Java programmer at the time. But I thought to myself, you know, I, I must write Rails. I kept thinking to myself, I must write Rails. And this is, this is a photo of me from 2006. Um, I looked it up. And unfortunately, at that time, nobody was hiring Rails developers. It was not a job that existed. Now, two friends of mine, two coworkers, they quit, they quit their jobs, and they decided to start a startup, and they decided to do it in Rails. And I was so unhappy being a Java developer that I decided, I was like, all right, I'm going to quit my job and join all of you. And unfortunately, that cost me 25% uh, of my salary. Because <laughs> unfortunately, nobody was writing using Rails at the time. Anyway, after I joined this company, I knew I had to do, I, I had to do something about this. The reason my salary had dropped so much is because Nobody, there was no competition. Nobody was hiring Rails developers, and there weren't any, really any Rails jobs out there. So I decided to get in, involved with Ruby the language and Rails the framework so that I could improve them and try to get, make them better and increase their popularity such that we could have more companies so I could go work at a different, different job, a uh, different, better job, and get more people uh, involved in the communities writing Ruby apps and writing Ruby code uh, so that not just so that I could get a job somewhere else, but also so that everyone else could have this feeling that I felt too, which was having development be fun. So 
basically, the long story, there's a long story and a very roundabout way of getting to say, like, I, I really want to thank all of you. I want to thank all of you for writing Rails applications. I want to thank you for writing Ruby code because you're the, one that, you're the ones that are help spreading these values and making it so that we can all have jobs and writing code for fun. So, all right, uh, that, yes, thank you. You should give yourself a round of applause. Good job. <laughs> write, more, write more Ruby code, please. So now let, let's, let's do the technical portion of my presentation, which I apologize to you at almost 9 p.m. This is a very technical talk, but I will do my best to make it easy. Well, I'm trying my best to make it easy. So I'm going to talk to you about a compacting GC for MRI. This is a patch that I've been working on, some code I've been working on. And it took me three years to complete this. <laughs> Uh, to be honest, this presentation is about the most. This is this presentation is about the most difficult code I've ever written in my life. Um, so I I hope that I have distilled it so everyone can understand. And if you don't, uh, ask please please ask me questions. I I don't think I will get to come to Ukraine very often. So take advantage of my time here and ask me stuff, please. Uh, so first off, what what is compaction? Essentially what compaction is, is basically taking allocated memory and free memory, like say we have a picture of this, this is our computer memory here, we have allocated and free chunks in our memory, and we're basically just rearranging them so that they're all next to each other like this, and then combining them together so we have just one allocated memory chunk and one free memory chunk. And some of you may, may remember this, uh, it's essentially doing like defragging your hard drive, but instead of doing this on a hard drive, we're actually doing it in memory. Uh, so this is, this is, for those of you that don't know, it's exactly what I s described, just only on a hard drive. So that is what compaction is, but why should we compact? What is the benefit of compaction? One benefit is that it gives us more efficient memory usage. So for example, let's say we have memory layout that looks like this. Uh, but we'd like to allocate something new. We want to allocate something down here, but it's too wide, so it won't fit inside of that free memory area. And if we try to allocate over here, it's too wide for this one too, so we can't, we can't fit there. And in this case, we're essentially out of memory because we can't allocate what we need. Now, if we were to rearrange these such that the free memory was chunked together, now we actually have an area wide enough that that chunk that we wanted to allocate, we can allocate. So we're able to use our, uh, we're able to use our memory more efficiently. The other advantage is uh, CPU caches. Now, uh, when a program reads memory, it has to go through the CPU in order to get that memory. It has to ask the CPU. The CPU will read memory in chunks from your RAM, and that chunk will be stored inside of a CPU cache. So it's basically a fixed width amount of memory that's read out of your main system memory. Now when the program executes, it'll try to read, it'll, it'll ask the CPU, give me some memory, the CPU will read it, it goes into the CPU cache, and as the program reads, it says, okay, that's good, we can read out of here, it's fast, but now we want to read a different area, we have to move to a different section of RAM because we didn't finish our computation, so we move over here, read that amount of memory, and then continue on with our program. Now, Unfortunately, reading from a different location is much slower than reading from CPU cache. If we could read, always be reading from a CPU cache, our program will be able to run faster, and this is where uh, compaction can help us out. If we were to rearrange the memory that we needed so that we have allocated chunks all together, when we do this read, all the data that we need can fit inside of the CPU cache, and we don't have to pay the price of moving to a different, reading from a different location. Jumping, that jumping around costs us time. Now this, this uh, phenomenon of reading from one section of CPU cache, this is what's called uh, good locality because it means that all the data that we need, it's local to each other. Uh, now another, another advantage is copy on write friendliness. Uh, at work, at GitHub, we use a unicorn web server. It saves memory by using a copy on write technique. Uh, and compaction can increase the, can increase copy on write efficiency. And what copy and write is, is when a, let's say we have a parent process, whenever the parent process forks a new process, uh, it'll create a child process, but that child process, uh, that child process copies the parent's memory. But 
actually, it doesn't copy the parent's memory. What it actually does is it points to the parent's memory like this. So when you fork a new child, you don't double the amount of memory you use uh, because it, it looks like it's doubled, but it's not actually. We're just pointing at the parent's memory. This is called virtual memory. Uh, now, if the child process wants to write to some memory, let's say it wants to write to this free chunk down here, uh, the operating system will copy that memory from the parent process to the child process such that the child can read from it. So essentially it severs that arrow there and copies that section down to the child process. Now, unfortunately, the operating system can't copy just the amount of memory you need, it'll copy a fixed width chunk. And what that means is it'll, it can copy more data than you actually want it to copy. So instead of just copying this free memory here, it actually might copy the free memory and the allocated memory, even though we only wanted to write to the free memory. So this means that our child process actually consumes more memory than we really wanted it to. Now, all these problems that I've shown you, essentially they're all solved by doing something which is called eliminating fragmentation. Compaction is the solution for eliminating the problems of fragmentation. And again, fragmented memory is essentially memory that looks like this, where we have free memory that's interspersed with allocated memory. And compaction is just moving it around so that we have allocated memory all next to each other and free memory all next to each other. So this is a non-fragmented heap. Now in Ruby there's actually, before we, before we actually talk about the compactor itself, I wanna say that our Ruby program actually has two heaps. We can think of it as having two heaps. Let's say, let's imagine the memory that's inside of our computer, the total amount. So we have system memory here, this is our total amount of memory here. Now, when we allocate memory, we use the malloc system call. That system call asks the operating system for memory. When we do that, we create something that I like to call the malloc heap. This is all of the memory we allocate using malloc. Inside of this is Ruby's object heap. So this is where we allocate Ruby objects out of the Ruby object heap. So we essentially have two different heaps here, the malloc heap and the Ruby object heap. Ruby's object heap is con contained inside of the malloc heap, and every time we allocate a new Ruby object, it comes out of R the Ruby's heap, right here. So it'll live in there. Ideally, the Ruby heap would be exactly the same size as the malloc heap, but our program will actually allocate data outside of the Ruby heap, in the malloc heap itself, and I'll give you an easy example of that. One example is a string. So in this example, the Ruby object representing the string is allocated inside of Ruby's object heap, but the actual string buffer itself is allocated inside of the malloc heap. And this is one reason why the malloc heap and the Ruby heap will never be the same size. Now, the important thing here to remember is that fragmentation, that problem we discussed earlier, can occur inside of both of these heaps, not just Ruby's heap. For the malloc heap at work, we use uh, an allocator called JE malloc. Uh, I recommend using this in production. It is safe to use. We use it, and it is great. So go Google this later. We're not going to talk about it now. Just remember, JE malloc, Google. <laughs> uh, for the Ruby heap, uh, we use something called gc.compact, which is the patch I wrote in the subject of the presentation today. So let's take a look at how Ruby's heap is built. Uh, and I don't mean the system memory or the malloc heap, I mean the Ruby object heap stored inside of those two. Ruby's heap layout looks something like this. Uh, Ruby objects are represented by a fixed amount of memory. Each Ruby object is 40 bytes wide. So it's 40 bytes wide. Uh, and we call those 40 byte chunks a slot. And each slot can either be uh, empty or filled. And later I'm going to introduce a new color called moved. We'll call it moved. But right now we'll just think empty and filled. Uh, each of these slots are stored on a contiguous chunk of memory and that contiguous chunk of memory is called a page. So this is one page. And each page is approximately 16 kilobytes. Now, Ruby's object heap is uh, made up of multiple pages, so it's consisted of many different pages. So we have multiple 16 kilobyte pages. And each of these 16 kilobyte pages is allocated using malloc, like this. Now one final thing to know about this is that each slot has a unique address. So each one of these slots has one unique address. 
So now we have all the information we need to build our compactor. Trust me, you'll see. <laughs> so let's, lo let's look at the, now that we know about this heap layout, let's look at the actual algorithm. We have the information to build the algorithm. The algorithm that I use is called a two-finger compactor, uh, and it was originally implemented in 1964, which is a long time ago. Uh, it originated from Lisp. It is not the most efficient compaction scheme, but it is very easy, and we can talk about why I chose this later. Uh, it d consists of two different steps, essentially moving objects and then updating the references. We're gonna look at moving objects first and then updating references. The algorithm itself works by uh, pointing two different fingers, which is why it's called a two-finger compactor, on either side of the heap, and one of them is called a free pointer and one is called the scan pointer. The free pointer moves to the right until it finds a free slot, and the scan pointer moves to the left until it finds a full slot. So scan, scan, free, scan, yes, okay. Once it finds those two, uh, once it finds a free slot and a full slot, it swaps them, like this, uh, and then it leaves a forwarding address. It says, okay, the object that was at nine, at slot nine, it is now at slot four, so we'll leave a forwarding address there. Then we repeat the algorithm, the free slot, free pointer moves forward, the scan pointer moves backwards, it swaps them and leaves a forwarding address, and we repeat this process until the two fingers meet. And at this point, we have compacted the heap. That's it. It's completely compacted. We have, one, we have one more step, and that step is updating references. Let's say we have a heap that looks like this. This is before compaction. After compaction, it's gonna look something like this. In order to update the references, what we do is we essentially walk through each object asking for its references and updating them. So A points at six. Six did not move, so we move on. B points at nine, nine moved to four, so we update its reference to point at four. C points at five, or points at eight, but it now needs to point at five, so we move it, and then continue on with this process through each object in the heap, yay, go, arrow, yes. Until we're done. Now all of our references are updated. We've compacted the heap and updated references. Once everything is done, we just change these two moved slots back to free slots, and that's it. We've done it. So I'm gonna show you this algorithm in Ruby, in Ruby code. I translated it to Ruby code because I wrote it all in C, and this is a Ruby <laughs> meetup, Ruby conference. And I think we might like reading Ru Ruby better than C. <laughs> So this is, this is what the algorithm looks like, and I don't need you to read it too closely. Essentially, it's just what I described to you in English. Essentially, what we do is we check to see have these two pointers met, and if they haven't, we go through our loop. Uh, here, we copy and for leave a forwarding address, and then down here, we check, okay, now we need to move the, move the free, free pointer, and then here, we retreat the scan pointer, and then we check to see if they're met, we just re repeat this process. So that's it. Uh, now, this is what the reference updating code looks like, again, in Ruby. Uh, it would look something like this. All we do is iterate over each slot in the heap, looking at its references, and then updating the references for that particular slot. Now, looking at this code, uh, it seems like updating references is actually the easiest part of this process, but in fact, it's actually the most difficult. And the issue is right here. This method, slot.references, is hiding a whole lot of complexity. And to give you an idea what that complexity is, we have to know like how do hashes hold references, how do arrays hold references, how do objects hold references, how do regular expressions hold references, how do ranges hold references, all the different types of objects that are in a Ruby program, we need to know how they hold references and how to update them. So I'm gonna show you the actual reference updating code. This is the actual reference updating code. Uh, hold on a sec, this, is, this isn't all of it, I will show you all of it. That is all of it. <laughs> now, I didn't count. I didn't count exactly, but I estimate that the reference updating code is approximately 80% of the code that I had to write. So because it's so difficult and complex, I wanna talk a little bit about it. That, uh, I wanna talk about some of the challenges behind that, and essentially it's supporting C extensions is one of the hardest parts. 
Uh, I came up with a way to support, or a scheme for supporting C extensions. This has been the blocker forever, why this has never been implemented, is essentially how do we support C extensions. I came up with a way to do it that I don't think anybody else had come up before, with before, and I'm gonna introduce to you now, uh, and we'll talk about how it works. So, as I said, the most difficult thing about updating references is figuring out where those references are stored. For example, we can read the implementation of an array. Like, let's say you and I, tonight, all of us together, we are Ruby core developers. We're, on, we're all on the Ruby core team, all of us. And we're implementing this patch. All of us, we can go look at the implementation of array. And we can read the code and understand how array stores references to other objects. We know that it points at a buffer, and that buffer points at a bunch of other objects. So since we know that, we can say, when it, in the compaction scheme, we can say, okay, that we know it's an array, we know how to update its references, we'll go do that. We can do the same thing for hashes. We can go look at the implementation of a hash. We know that a hash points at some values, it also points at some keys, and we can update all of those locations. And we can repeat this process for all types, strings, classes, modules, everything. We can go, all of us on, on the Ruby core team, all of us, we can go read that code and fix it. So the GC can update all of these known types. These are known types because they're all known to us. But this asks, a, begs a question like what is, if we have known types, these known types are implemented by Ruby, what about unknown types? What are those? Unknown types, I consider those to be types implemented in C and I'm gonna give you a concrete example of an issue we ran into at work. At work we use a Yagile as our JSON parser and from this code, this is a C extension, and this, this is the main struct of the C extension, it can actually store two Ruby objects in that struct right here. Uh, this, this way, like, the way that it's used at runtime is we'll actually malloc this, um, malloc this struct, then we have a Ruby object allocated out of the Ruby heap, so the malloc one is stored in the malloc heap, and the Ruby one is stored in the Ruby heap, the Ruby object points at the malloc one, then that malloc one points at two different other Ruby objects, the builder stack and the parse complete stack, and we don't really care what those are, we just know that it has those references. Now, the GC doesn't know anything about this type, so it doesn't know anything about this struct at all, so it doesn't know how to update these references. So if the compactor decides to move one of these objects, and the, the struct would point at the wrong location and the whole program would crash using all of the keynote, all of the keynote stuff. Uh, so, how do we fix this? How do we prevent this type of crash? The secret in dealing with this is uh, to use the Yagile marking function. The marking function, all C extensions have to mark their references, and the way that they mark their references, they have to keep those references alive, and the way they keep them alive is by using the RBGC mark function. So when an object is passed to RBGC mark, we essentially don't let it move anymore. So we say, anything marked with RBGC mark cannot move. So I'll give you an example here. We have a heap that looks like this with a Yagile object that points at two unknown objects. So here's our Ruby code up here. And then we have an array object that points at two strings, for example. During the mark phase, uh, we introduce what's called a pin bit table. And during the mark phase, when RBGC mark gets called, it pins those things. So Yagile uses RBGC mark and we pin those two. We say, okay, they can't move anymore. Now, the Ruby array won't use RBGC mark. It uses a different function called GC mark no pin, and these are private functions. And since it use those, uses those functions, those do not get a pin bit set. Now, during compaction, we say we do exactly the same algorithm we did before, except that we scan for a free, where we look for a free, and then when we get to the scan point, the scan pointer says, well, that's pinned, we can't move it, and then just moves on. So it swaps those two, and does exactly the same algorithm, it just says, oh, if there's a pin bit, we won't move it. Okay, yes. Now during reference updating, it looks at the, the reference updater looks at Yagile, and it doesn't know how to update references, but that's fine, because we know that none of them moved, so it's safe. It does know how to update arrays, so it fixes those, and then moves on with the rest of the heap as normal. Yay! Go! Arrow! Woo! <laughs> Sorry, I'm so, I'm so proud of my keynote. <laughs> I, oh, thank you, thank you, okay. 
So known types, known types use GC mark no pin, and this is an internal function to Ruby, and it doesn't pin those objects, where unknown types, this is a public function, will use rbgc mark, and it will pin those things. So another thing that I introduced is a way to allow movement inside of C extensions. To do this, I introduced three different concepts, uh, compaction callback, a no, no pin marking, and a new location function. So the GC can't update a C extension, but a C extension can update itself. So the Yagile extension knows what its own internals. The C GC doesn't know Yagile's internals, but Yagile does, so it can do it. The C extension can update itself. So what we're gonna do now is a quick walkthrough of how to update the Yagile extension so that it supports compaction. Before compaction, uh, before we add compaction support, we have to declare mark functions, a mark function and a sweep function. So these get called when the GC marks and frees. We register these two, these two callbacks. Essentially what I introduced is a third, a third callback where we say, okay, now we have a compaction callback as well. And this compaction callback will get called every time the GC compacts. Next we need to update the marking function where we say rather than calling rbgc mark, we call rbgc mark no pin. So this says, hey, mark this reference, but don't pin it. Finally, the last step is we need to update the compaction callback so that it gets the new location of that object. So this function rbgc location will give us the new location of the object if it moved. Now I wanna show one known issue. There's actually one known issue with this, this whole scheme. Up until now, everything has seemed great. But there is actually one issue that's kind of annoying. So let's, let's look at some Ruby objects. Let's say we have three different Ruby objects. One implemented in Ruby, one implemented in C, and the third one, we don't care. Either one, it doesn't matter. Let's say you're a C extension author and you have a Ruby object and it points at this third object. You have a Ruby object there, it points at this one. And you have a C object and it points at this other one. Now you know that the Ruby object will mark this third one. So you think, ah, I don't need to mark it from C, so I will not mark it. I will mark this one, it's this one's automatically marked. And I know that it's automatically marked, so I'm not gonna mark it here. I just won't do it. I'm a lazy developer. I'm a lazy and not good <laughs> developer. <laughs> so what will happen during compaction in this case? In this case, since the object wasn't marked via RBGC mark, the compactor will think it's okay to move. So it'll move it like this during compaction, and then during reference updating, it'll update the Ruby object because it knows how to update those references, but it won't update the C object because it doesn't know about those references. So we change it to a free. When the program executes, it blows up because we have a bad pointer. Now maybe this isn't common. This may not be a common case. I did find it in three different places. One is here in the Ruby VM instructions. I'm not gonna go too in depth into how this particular thing works, but essentially it's that same object setup just kind of twisted a little bit. Uh, now I was able to fix this particular issue uh, by introducing a patch called um, direct marking, which is shipped in Ruby 2.6. And essentially what it does is it eliminates that third Ruby object. So all Ruby objects are marked directly from instruction sequences. So this means those objects won't move anymore. The other side benefit of this is it means that your programs will actually consume less memory. Uh, we found about a 3% memory reduction in production when we used Ruby 2.6. Uh, so that, that fixes this, this particular issue. The other one I found in JSON, the JSON gem does exactly this object setup. Uh, so I fixed that one. Unfortunately, well, a, a neat thing that you can do is, since these references are held in Ruby, you can write a Ruby program to cut the reference. So I can cut that reference using a pure Ruby program. Now that pure Ruby program might be a weird Ruby program, but you can do it. And if you do that, the garbage collector will run and it will get rid of that object and then the program blows up. So I'll give you, I'll give you an example. Yeah, look at that terrible slide. So here's our problem code. What happened was we say, okay, the JSON, JSON gem says, give me the internal constant NAN and it assigns it to a global and it never marks it. So what I did was I said, okay, I will remove <laughs> the NAN constant, <laughs> run the GC, and then the program will crash. 
So this, is, this cuts the reference right there and crashes the program. The fix is actually super easy. We just say, hey, go mark these objects. It's fine. Found exactly the same issue in the message pack gem, and I was able to write a, a pure Ruby program that would cut the reference and, of course, make the whole thing blow up. Woo! Uh, but the idea is that pure Ruby programs should not crash. So I was able to write, a, write an issue saying, hey, I wrote a pure Ruby program using message pack. I know it's a weird program, but it segvs the process. So you should consider this a bug. And fortunately, I was able to convince the authors, and they agreed, so we fixed it. But now this is, this is kind of a long story, but what this really boils down to is one very simple rule for us is that for us C extension writers is if you hold a reference, you must mark the reference. That's it, it's one simple rule. If you hold a reference, mark the reference. Now I'll give you an even easier rule, very easy, and that is to don't write C code. <laughs> if, you, if you don't write C code, if you just write Ruby code, you don't need to worry about any of this. <laughs> uh, three years, don't worry about it. <laughs> All right, so I want to go through one more challenge, and that's object ID. Uh, this, this, is, this is an annoying challenge. Um, so a theme throughout these slides is that uh, uh, the overall theme is that having direct access to a Ruby object prevents the object from moving. That is the overarching theme. If you know where it is in memory, we can't really move it. So direct, access, direct memory access prevents moving, generally speaking. Uh, so one example, this, this, you may not know this, but one example of direct memory access is actually, the, actually from object ID. It's based on the location. So if you call object ID in the one slot, it'll return one, and on two, it'll return two, and on nine, it'll return nine, okay? Uh, look, if you call object ID in your actual Ruby program, it's kind of obfuscated, but that number you get back is actually based on the location in memory. Now, the question is, if I move this Ruby object, what object ID should it have? And the answer is, it depends. So I'll, I'll give you an example. Let's say we have an object ID after we move. So we, we run this code, allocates in four, we compact the heap, it moves to one. Now when you call object ID, the number you get back is one. And it makes sense, because you didn't see it when it was in slot four, you didn't know. So let's do another example. Uh, we create a new object, it goes in four, we access the object ID, it returns four, we compact the heap, it moves to one, what should this be? Well, we need to, we have to remember what that object ID was because all of us expect it to stay the same. So in order to do that, I introduced a, a global hash of seen object IDs. This is essentially the implementation, but written in Ruby. I wrote it in C, this is a Ruby translation. So we look at the memory location and we store off the one that you saw. Then we, we can return it. So in this example, again, I'll show you, we move, we allocate it in four. Here we store it into a table at four. We saw the object ID was four, so we compact, moves to one. And then we update the table so we know the object in one is, has an object ID of four. So we return four here, so everything works. Now let's do a more, an even more annoying example. <laughs> Create a new object, we access the object ID as usual, we compact. Uh, the object ID remains the same, everything is good, but then we allocate a new object ID, and that object ID is in four. <laughs> what should that object ID be? <laughs> this is a very annoying problem. So what this is, is we, ha we essentially have a collision, and in this case, what I did is I said, okay, uh, <laughs> If you've seen, if we've seen this, we'll just increment by one. And if you haven't, we just keep doing that until we find one that hasn't been seen before. So in, the, in this case, we'll say, okay, uh, we do the same, same thing here, allocate in four, compact, it moves, uh, one points at four, we allocate a new object, that goes in four, and then this one will now be five. So we incremented by one. Now, of course, we also have to clean this up in the GC because when the object gets freed, we have to clean up that table. This is the code for cleaning up the table. So in short, don't use object ID. <laughs> uh, actually, go, go ahead and use it, it's fine. I'm not telling, don't go out and like, don't go out and rewrite everything to not use it. I mean, if you're using it in production code, you probably shouldn't be. Uh, 
use something else, you can. Um, but you know, just in general, try not to use it that much. But it's okay. Like, don't don't run out and change your code. Um, so let's take a look at the actual impact. We studied what the memory layout looks like at the beginning of the presentation, and I want to show you a visualization. This is a basic Rails application. This is what the memory looks like, the heap looks like for a basic Rails application. And each column in this image is a page that we talked about. It's a page. And each dot in that page is a slot, so it represents a Ruby object. Each red dot is a Ruby object that cannot move. It's pinned. Each black dot is a Ruby object that can move. And each white dot is a uh, free space. So we can see from this that our heap is very fragmented. We have a lot of free space interspersed among our allocated objects. Now, after we run the compactor, uh, it looks like this. So it's kind of hard to tell, but it actually got skinnier, which means we were able to eliminate some pages. And you can also see that we don't have, uh, we don't have all those free slots everywhere. So I'm going to show you one more example, and this is on the GitHub application. Uh, the top column, or the top one is before compaction, and the bottom one is after compaction. And it's very large, but we can see an impact, and I'll show you. This, is, this isn't the full heap. Here is the full... This is the full thing. <laughs> so you can see that it does actually compact things over to the side. So I want to talk a little bit about future plans, and then we'll end this. First off, I want to do some performance improvements to this patch. Right now, it is very, very inefficient. Uh, it goes through four different steps. Those four steps are a full GC. It moves all the objects, updates references, then does a full GC again. I think we can eliminate this last GC. I don't think that's necessary. And I also think it may be possible to eliminate the full GC at the beginning. Essentially, what we would do is just say, after a major GC has occurred, then we'll do the compaction. So we can reduce it to two steps. Uh, another thing I would like to do is implement a sliding compactor. And essentially, the difference between a sliding compactor and a, and a two-finger compactor is that rather than doing swaps, we essentially just slide everything down like this. Everything gets slid down like that. Now, the reason I want to do this is because uh, it has a couple advantages over a two-finger compactor. First off, it has better locality. Uh, so, for example, like the, the two-finger compactor, it means that your objects will end up in random locations through your memory. It'll be compacted, but the location is random. So, for example, let's say you allocated an array, and that array has a bunch of objects in it. Those objects could end up scattered everywhere, where a sliding compactor will slide all of those together and hopefully get us better locality. The other advantage is it supports variable widths. So we said earlier each Ruby object is only 40 bytes wide, and the two-finger compactor, it depends on that fact. It depends on the, the fact that it's a fixed width. A uh, sliding compactor does not depend on that at all, so we can get rid of that requirement. And what that means is we can, another thing I want to implement is variable width allocation. Uh, if I'm able to implement variable width allocation, what that means is we can uh, eliminate the, the requirement of things like JE malloc. So that is the end of my presentation. You can go there and see the actual bug, and it is finally merged. Thank you so much for having me. It is an honor to be here. And if you have questions, wait, clap and then questions. All right, clap. <laughs> questions.
that's a good question. No, first thought, two two issues. Um, the the patch that I showed, the patch that I gave or showed here, only impacts the Ruby heap. Uh, it doesn't impact the malloc heap, and the um, uh, the performance of the malloc heap is different than the performance of the Ruby heap. So, I guess the answer is kind of nuanced. Yes, it will eliminate it will eliminate those Ruby pages, but typically when that occurs, that that type of thing occurs, it's actually to do with the system's malloc. Uh, we've seen that in production as well, which is why we switched to JE malloc, and JE malloc will release back to the operating system more efficiently. So the answer is yes, but. <laughs> also, also another thing is that I, I guess I didn't. Oh. Two gigs. Okay. So another another thing I failed to mention here is that this is I, I should have put this in the things I want to do part, but this is a manual compactor. You have to specifically say gc.compact. Uh, the next step is to make it automatic. But since it's so efficient in since it's so inefficient right now, I don't want it to be automatic. Thank you. Right, so, so two things is, first off, I wanted to make sure that as many, as many objects could move as possible. Second, um, there are a lot of things, actually there's three reasons. Second, there are a lot of things that use object ID but you don't know it. Uh, for example, hash keys, hash keys will use object ID, so it means that a bunch of hash keys could get pinned. Um, I found one weird thing is calling like, uh, what was it? Two i on a string will actually look at the object ID, and th there's a reason for it, but it's just annoying. It's like you you wouldn't even know in your code that that's happening. So a lot more objects could get pinned than I wanted. And the third reason is um, I forgot what the third reason was. Ah, the third reason the third reason is that the uh, the pin bits are ephemeral. They only happen on mark. So um, calling object ID wouldn't keep the pin bit around forever, right? So that's why basically implementation, implementation details make it hard. So doing this annoying stuff was a win for all cases, even though I had to write some annoying code. <laughs> <laughs> I should have had, had a... Actually, actually, we're talking about, so another thing I'm gonna do is change it to a global ID that just increments forever um, and not base it off memory at all. Yes? Yeah, first of all, thanks for coming and uh, this great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. So uh, we use it in production. The place that we use it, it, it's manual. You have to trigger it yourself. So what we do at work is we do it right before uh, unicorn forks. So basically back at the, eh, let's find my slides here. Let's see. Way back at the beginning of my presentation here. So we use it for copy and write performance. Essentially what it means is we say like, okay, at this point before we fork, before we actually fork to a child process, we'll compact all of these together so that when the child process does get created, all the free slots are together and we copy as little memory as possible down to the child process. 
So we, we try to share as much memory as possible. You'll see with, you'll see with web server, forking web servers like Unicorn that the amount of memory will actually grow and then plateau at a certain point. Um, and this reduces the uh, height of the plateau. I hope that, it, does that answer your question? Okay. Those are, those are extremely good and extremely painful questions. <laughs> so, um, uh, nobody reviewed it. <laughs> like, okay, I, I, like, I'm just gonna be, I'll be, I'll be honest with you. The patch is, I think the patch is maybe like 3,000 line, 3, lines long. And unfortunately, like, um, I really, 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 really wanted somebody to review it because it was so complicated uh, that I was sure I got something wrong, right? So I, like, we had been testing it for a while at work, and the way that, the way that we test it is we would just try it and see if it crashed. And if it didn't crash, then we're, we're doing pretty good. Um, so I submitted, that was, at that point I thought, okay, well, um, I'll, submit, I'll submit the patch now. Uh, but one, one thing is that I gave, I gave these caveats in my presentation, the, the, let's find it here. Where was it? The known issue. So this known issue stuff. Uh, I made the patch, I made the patch, I submitted it, and I knew it was long and I was really, really hoping someone would review it. And um, I thought for sure, so I, I gave this presentation in Japan, though I gave it in Japanese. Oh. <laughs> uh, 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 because I thought for sure that this known, this known issue would be a blocker, like we wouldn't be able to merge the patch because of this, because of this issue. And I thought for sure I would have to convince the rest of the core team, like, hey, this, this is correct. We need to do this. People need to mark the references. It's their bug, not ours. So I submitted, I submitted the patch, and within, I don't know, 48 hours, Matt's responded and was like, yeah, good. Go for it. Like, it's fine. <laughs> and I thought, I thought I had, like, a couple more months to work on it. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was like, okay, uh, does anyone else, like any, everyone else okay with this? And nobody responded and like Koichi, he's the VM author, he was like, oh, so can you commit this now please? And I'm like, fine, so I commit it and it breaks all the tests. Nobody reviewed it, nobody reviewed it. <laughs> Literally nobody reviewed it. <laughs> so like, it was, it was breaking tests and I was just really, really trying to fix them, so it was insanely stressful. It was very stressful. And I think the problem, the problem with this particular thing is that, uh, this, particular, this particular feature is um, the thing I talked about earlier, trying to find references for everything, it's so complicated and you have to do it, you can't do it incrementally, it has to be everything. If you don't do everything, it will break. Um, and because of that, the patch got very long, and of course, nobody wants to, nobody reads long patches. It's just a fact, right? Like, you have to keep your patches short so that people will read it and actually review the code. So, the, that is the long answer, is that nobody, nobody reviewed the patch. Uh, as for testing, I wrote some tests for it, um, and the tests, when we ran the tests, I could run the tests locally and it was fine. Uh, <laughs> 
But when they went up to the CI, it would crash the CI. So basically, we would just, I would look at the errors on the CI and just keep trying to fix them. And um, uh, Ruby's CI is different than most CIs. It runs all the tests on many different architectures. Um, but you'll know like a lot of, when you submit a pull request, typically the CI runs your test once, right? And then it gives you green check or whatever. The problem with the doing GC work is that garbage collectors are inherently random. And that means that the bugs that come up are random. Uh, so that means if you get a check mark, like you could get a check mark, green check mark like 99% of the time. But that 1%, it's important. You have to fix 100%, right? So you can't just run the test once. So Ruby CI runs the test constantly, over and over and over and over, just constantly. Uh, so I submitted the patch and it started breaking the builds, but it would break like 1% of the builds. But that's still like a bunch of messages in our Slack channel like yelling at me. So finally, <laughs> finally the other day, literally the other day, like finally we sat down and reviewed it reviewed it and Koichi finally understood the algorithm and we've got all, most of the bugs fixed basically at this point. So it was not an easy or fun process. I will say that. Uh, I don't think it's, I wouldn't say that it's difficult to become a Ruby core contributor, but to do this might take a while. So you can get involved fairly easy. The C code actually isn't that bad. And if you want to be a Ruby contributor, we actually, there's a lot of Ruby, or a core contributor, there's a lot of code in Ruby that's just written in Ruby. So you can check that. Um, but yeah, to do this, it might, it might take a while. <laughs> I, could not, I could not have written this when I started, for sure. I hope that answers. Yes. Yeah, hello. Yes. Thank you for, for such a great topic. And I have a question regarding the visual improvement. And uh, you said that uh, you are, uh, in the future, uh, you will be uh, uh, involved in the compact in the garbage collector when you will be uh, working as a product. Right, uh, so it still has, it'll still have benefit for say like if you're using Puma, a threaded web server, you'll still get benefit out of it, f hopefully from uh, reduced memory overhead because we can eliminate some of those pages since we have compacting pages. It means that, or compacting, compacting the pages means that you'll need fewer pages uh, overall on average. So it should save some memory there. Uh, and uh, when we get the, when I change it to a sliding compactor, hopefully it will reduce, or it'll speed up your program due to increased locality. Uh, but to be honest, like, so this is an interesting thing. I think, uh, I think Ruby has really, really bad locality to begin with. Uh, so I'm not sure that we'll actually see any improvements there until, so, it's, I have like a very long game plan here. Uh, the, it, I don't know how technical you want me to get. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get technical, I'm just gonna do it. So uh, if you have a class, a class contains a method table. This is just an example of poor locality. That method table is a hash. You can imagine it as a Ruby hash. Now uh, that Ruby hash is allocated the, inside of the malloc heap. Okay, it's not allocated as a Ruby object. There is a Ruby object, but it points at a, at a uh, location in the malloc heap. And what that means is that that hash is not stored next to, they're not stored next to each other in memory. They're not contiguous. Which means when you access that hash, uh, it has to jump to a different location. So we already have poor locality in the first place. So this is the reason why I want to be able to do variable width variable width allocations is so that we can say, okay, I'm gonna allocate a hash and I'm gonna allocate the actual backing structure, the data structure of that, we'll allocate the Ruby object and we'll allocate the actual structure next to it. So we'll get good locality out of that. And that should increase performance for things like hash lookups and for uh, method tables and those types of things. But uh, for us to get to that point, I, I gotta go through all this, like it's a 
major yak shave, essentially. <laughs> So hopefully those things will help out threaded web servers, but in the short term, I would look for lower memory usage. Thank you so much.